In the year 1311 before the Common Era, the Jewish people were poised to enter the land of Israel. But before entering, they sent spies ahead to ensure it was safe. When ten of the twelve spies returned with a negative report, the Jewish people took it to heart and cried all through the night. The Almighty then spoke, saying, Because you have cried this meaningless cry, I will give you a reason to cry on this day. This marked the first Tisha B'Av, which to this day is still observed on the ninth day of the Hebrew month of Av. After this, the Jewish people spent forty long years in the desert, and for forty long years they watched helplessly as their loved ones perished on each passing Tisha B'Av. Finally, in the year 1272 BCE, the Jewish people entered the land of Israel. Some 400 years passed and they built their temple, which stood for centuries, only to be destroyed 410 years later by the Babylonians. It was the year 422 BCE when the temple fell on the very day of Tisha B'Av. The Jews retreated into exile for 70 years and then returned to build a second temple. This temple stood for 420 years before the Romans destroyed it, an event that took place in the year 70 CE, on the very day of Tisha B'Av. The Jews then galvanized and mounted a rebellion that routed the Romans out of Israel. Alas, the victory was short-lived as the Romans surged back into Israel with a vengeance for blood, leaving nearly one million Jews slaughtered in their wake. And Betar, the stronghold of the Jewish rebellion, was destroyed on the very day of Tisha B'Av. In the aftermath of war, the battles waged on. Before long, the Romans resolved to forever destroy the Jewish people's connection to their land of Israel. In their efforts, the Romans plowed over the Temple Mount on the very day of Tisha B'Av. Jews would later be driven out of England in the year 1290 and out of Spain in 1492, both times on the very day of Tisha B'Av. And yet another tragedy would fall on this day, the start of World War I, marking the beginning of the end for Jews in Europe. History has proven that the Jewish people have reason to cry on this day, yet even as this part of our history is fulfilled, we yearn in earnest for the day when the bookend also comes true and the third temple is built. Until then, we lament and consider the resilience of our people on this very day of Tisha B'Av. It's a real honor for me to be a part of this uh, tremendous video, and uh, it's even more of an honor that it's um, in, in memory of my good friend and, uh, and really uh, my partner in Partners in Torah, uh, Mendy Klein. Unfortunately, uh, as many of you know, we suffered the tragic loss in our community recently of Mendy, and I uh, thought it was appropriate to dedicate uh, this Tisha B'Av video uh, in his memory. One of the things that Mendy uh, was so passionate about was uh, Torah learning, and he did not believe that it needed to be uh, in any particular stream of Judaism. His dream was to bring a dedicated Partners in Torah to Cleveland, uh, modeled after other communities throughout the United States with one-on-one -on -one learning. He was a real, he was a person that was dedicated to solving problems, and uh, and that's what, what's greatly missed and is incumbent upon us to take the learning that we have uh, in the Torah and, uh, and put it to use and to put it to use every single day to make sure that, uh, that we are picking up where he, where he, left, where he left behind and, um, and to take the, um, the, the social challenges that we're currently um, experiencing as a community, the individual challenges that we're having as a community, and, and tackling them and making uh, our community a better place. And that's what he was about, and that's what we hope uh, that all of us can, can pick that up and continue that in the, in the work and the efforts that he taught us for so many years.
We're here on another Tisha B'Av. 3,000 years of Tisha B'Av. 3,000 years of mourning the tragedies that have befallen the Jewish people, specifically on this day, the destruction of the first temple, the destruction of the second temple, the destruction of the city of Betar, those three tragedies alone probably numbering in the three millions for the death toll. On throughout history, we saw the day rear its ugly face many, many times. The expulsion of Spanish Jewry in 1492, the outbreak of World War I in 1914, which led to the destruction of European Jewry and the eventual annihilation of European Jewry in World War II. So much pain and suffering right here on this day of Tisha B'Av. Yet we don't have to just look at the calendar to see the tragedies that have resulted because of Tisha B'Av. Because in truth, everything that the Jewish people have suffered through for generations is all a result of the fact that we are in exile, that we don't have a land that is truly ours, that we don't have a temple. So whether it happened on this day, whether it did not happen on this day, it's all attributed back to the state of the Jewish people and the exile that we are in. So how is it? How is it? Why is it that we have suffered so much? So much tragedy, so much difficulty, so much pain, so much suffering, so much bloodshed. What caused this state of Tisha B'Av that the Jewish people have been suffering through for so many generations? And the great Vilna Gon tells us that if we want to understand anything, we have to look towards the first time it appears in our Holy Torah. And the first time we see Tisha B'Av is in the second year after the Exodus. The Jewish people left the land of Israel. They went to Mount Sinai. They received the Ten Commandments. They received the Torah. They build the Mishkan. Finally, they're ready to go into the land of Israel. They're on the border. They're poised to go in. Yet they want to know what they're getting themselves into. They want to send in spies to check out the land. Moshe and Moses consults with the Almighty. Is this okay? The Almighty tells them, if you want to, shlach lecha anashim, you can do it. I'm not telling you to, but feel free to check it out. Moses collects one leader from each tribe and says, go check out the land so we can tell the people what we're getting ourselves into, what we have ahead of us with conquering this land. And those 12 spies go into the land of Israel, ahead of the rest of the Jewish people. They see giants, they see huge produce. 10 out of 12 of the spies are caught in a little bit of a hysteria as to what will be if they have to enter into the land of Israel. The commentators tell us they had their own vested interests as to why they wanted to stay in the desert and why they didn't want to enter the land. They come back to the Jewish people. They tell the Jewish people, the land is great in many ways, but there's no way we can conquer it. The giants are too big and too strong. Look at this produce that outsizes all of us. There's no way we can take over this land. Two of the spies, Yehoshua and Kalev, try to give a positive report, try and defend against the negativity, but to no avail. The Jewish people hear the negative report, the Dibas Haaretz, the Lush and Hara that was spoken about the land of Israel. And they cry. And they cry, and they cry, and they cry. Until the point where the Almighty says, as is quoted in the Talmud, Masech Titanus 29a, on this night you cried this meaningless cry. Therefore I am establishing this day as a day of crying for all generations. And that, my friends, was the first Tisha B'Av. That, my friends, was the ninth of Av when the spies came back with that negative report. The Jewish people cry, the meaningless cry, and that put Tisha B'Av on our calendar from that point forward. I believe we can ask a simple question over here. What in the world is going on? Think about it for a moment. 
we often refer to the Almighty as Avinu Sheba Shemayim, our Father in Heaven. We compare the relationship of parent to child to the relationship between us and the Almighty. So imagine the situation. Your kid comes to you, as they often do, crying about something silly, about something stupid, about something absolutely meaningless. And let's face it, dare I say, most of the time our children come to us crying, the cry is a bechia shelchinam, it's a meaningless cry. Now what if we responded as the Almighty did to us in the desert? Looking down at our children and saying, Oh, because you're crying this worthless, meaningless cry, I'm going to give you a reason to cry. Bam! You'd call child services. you take the children away. That's not how we parent our children. Yet that's what the Talmud tells us the Almighty did to us. Our dysfunctional father who art in heaven. How are we to understand this? So in truth, this this establishment of a day of crying for all generations was not a punishment. It wasn't that the Almighty is saying, you messed up, bam, now I'm going to give you a reason to cry. No, that's not the reason. The Almighty was telling us the reality of the situation. The reality was, because we were crybabies, because we were such, because the Jews in the desert were such, that they couldn't realize the good they had in front of them. Remember, these are the people who saw the ten plagues. They saw the splitting of the sea. They ate the manna from heaven. They drank the water from the miraculous well. Yet still they couldn't trust in the Almighty. They couldn't see what they were. The reality is such people are going to be subject to crying for all generations. Why is that? Why is that? So in truth, the answer is right there in the report that the spies came back with. The spies, when reporting what happened in the land of Israel, said that they saw these giants. The giants did not see them. But they saw the giants and they said in reference to these giants, that we were like grasshoppers in our eyes compared to them. We felt small. We felt insignificant. And so too we appeared in their eyes. Why did we appear as grasshoppers in their eyes? Because we looked at ourselves as grasshoppers. And because we looked at ourselves as grasshoppers, we cried this meaningless cry. And God says to the Jewish people, if you're going to live a life, if you're going to live a history of grasshoppers, what's happening on this night is going to just continue to happen for all generations. Until you can grow up, and realize how great you are. You're just going to continue to cry on this night. My friends, we have to realize how great we are. If we want it to be that there's no more Tisha B'Av anymore. If we want it to be that there's no more suffering anymore. If we want it to be that the world is going to be a better place. We just need to realize how great we are. And I'd like to give three suggestions on how we can do it. Number one, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, says in his monumental work, a very famous statement, Sheva Yipol Tzadik Vekom, that the righteous fall seven times and still get up. Most people understand this verse to mean that's the trait of the righteous. If you have a tzaddik, if you have a righteous person, no matter what happens to them, they get up. Says Rav Yitzchak Hutner, the great Rosh Yeshiva of Yeshiva's Rabbeinu Chaim in Berlin in New York, a survivor of the tortures of Europe, he himself survived a terrorist attack and being taken as a hostage on a trip to Israel. He writes in a letter to a student, 
The student wrote his Rebbe saying, life is difficult. I go to work, I have my children, I try to put bread on the table, I try to grow, yet I look at myself year after year and feel that I'm still the same exact person. I struggle, I fall, I struggle, I fall, and I feel like I'm just not getting anywhere in life. I feel like I'm not growing. I feel like I'm remaining the same exact person. Says Rev Hutner to his student, when Shlomo HaMelech said, the righteous falls seven times and get up, he was not explaining a character trait. No, he was giving the recipe. He was given the directive. He was telling you how to become righteous. The way you become righteous is when you fall, you get up. And when you fall and then get up, that's how you become a tzaddik. That's how you become righteous. So therefore, embrace the falling. Don't let it knock you down. Don't make it think you, you are a grasshopper. Because it's through that falling and through the getting up. It's through the trials and the tribulations of this world and how we approach those trials and tribulations that we can get out of grasshopper syndrome, that we can realize that no, we are not grasshoppers, that we are truly great people. That's number one. Embrace the falling, embrace the getting up as what will make us the people we want to become. Number two. It's all about our mindset. Today, there's many great books out there on business and leadership, but there's a classic that came out in 1937 before there was a New York Times bestsellers list, before there was Amazon, before all these books had proliferated on our bookshelves. And that book was Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich. And while the book talks a lot about money and making money, he really gives tremendous life lessons in that book. He explains in that book that if you have desire, faith, and persistence, you can propel yourself to great heights. You can achieve anything. That's his premise. And he goes on and on throughout the book telling stories and giving anecdotes of people who simply thought they could do something, who simply had their mind set on something, who simply stuck with it and were persistent. And those people achieved great things. Those people are the ones who changed the world. So therefore, just by the way we think, just by the way we perceive something, that is how we can change ourselves and that is how we can change the world. I'd like to share with you a story of a three-year-old Jewish boy named Gennady who immigrated from Belarus in 1978. As many of us remember that Russian influx that took place in the late 70s and the 80s and into the 90s. We remember how those people came with nothing. And that was Gennady's story. He lived in an apartment, a studio apartment in New York with eight other family members. His father got a job at a local liquor store. And before you knew it, the American dream started to play itself out. Gennady's father became the manager of the liquor store. They move out of the studio apartment to a house in New Jersey. Eventually, Gennady's father buys that liquor store. He's able to build it into a $5 million a year business. In 1998, Gennady comes into the business and he helps his father to build it into something even greater. Through his own talents, through launching a YouTube channel discussing wine and being a critic on wine, He's able to grow that business from a $5 million business in 1998 to a $20 million a year business just 10 years later. Gennady, who now goes by the name Gary, starts his own marketing company. He is an early investor in Facebook, Twitter, Uber. Today he's worth over $150 million. And when he talks about his success, he attributes it to one thing in his life. Gary once wrote, I recognize that my success is 100% attributable to how I was raised. My mother taught me to believe in myself the most. She always supported and cheered me on. 
Today, Gary Vaynerchuk is the CEO of VaynerMedia. He's one of the greatest entrepreneurs in our generation. He came from nothing, a true rags to riches story. And he says over and over and over again that the way he got there was that he was raised to think he was more than a grasshopper. He was raised to think he could do anything. He was raised with such a positive mindset. He didn't let the negativity get him down. And therefore, he, at the age of only 42 or 43, has already achieved amazing things, coming from nothing to such a high level in our society, all because of the mindset. And therefore, that's suggestion number two, that's step number two. We have to think positive. We have to aim big. We have to think we can do it, and we can't let the negativity get us down. And what's step number three? The Talmud in Tractate of Vodazar 17a tells a story of a man named Elazar ben Derdaya, who is one of the most debased characters ever to live in this world. The Talmud tells us that he visited every single prostitute in the world that he knew about. In one such visit, he had a certain hisarus, as we would call. He had a certain awakening, realizing how base his life was, how meaningless it was, how it was just chasing after his own desires. And he, in that moment, that moment of inspiration, that awakening, decided that he wanted to be better. And the Talmud tells us that he goes outside and starts begging for help in improving his situation. And he says, Shemayim va'aretz bikshu alai rachamim, heavens and earth, please intercede on my behalf. To which the heavens and earth said, sorry, we got ourselves to worry about. Harim the Gavos, mountains and hills, Bikshu Alai Rachami, mountains and hills, please help me out. Sorry, we have to take care of ourselves. Chama Vilavana, sun and moon, please help me out. Kochavim Vimazolos, please help me out. No, I'm sorry, we have our own situation to worry about. Finally, a Lazar ben Dodiah just sits down and comes to that stark realization Ain Hadover Toloi Ella B that the whole entire situation is dependent on me. And he puts down his head, and he cries, and he cries, and he cries, until his soul leaves his body. At that point, a boss call, a voice from heaven, comes out and says, Rebbe, a Lazar ben Dudaya, has been accepted into the world to come. The Talmud points out that even though he lived the life that he lived, he was able to be kaina olam b'sha achas. He was able to conquer his whole world in that one moment. And for teaching us that lesson, we give him the accolade, Rebbe. The lesson of Rebbe Lazar ben Durdaya is ein hadover toli ella b. That if we're going to get anywhere, if we're going to make it, that we don't have to have Tisha B'Av anymore, if we're going to be able to take any of this to heart and become better, we have to realize that it is all dependent on us and on us alone. So with these three steps, the first step, embracing the challenges, embracing the falling, and realizing that's how we become righteous, the second step of realizing that it's all our mindset, that we have to have positive focus, we can't let the negativity getting, get us down. And that third step of realizing ain hadover toloi ella b, that it's all dependent on me. That's what's going to make it that there's no more Tisha B'Av. That's what's going to make it that we're going to see the final redemption. That's what's going to make it that we will finally realize that no, we are not grasshoppers, we are giants. And we can achieve like giants. I'd like to conclude with the inspirational words of the great Rav Levi Yitzchak Berdichev, the great Hasidic Rebbe from one of the previous generations. He would regularly tell his disciples that we have to be like babies. We have to always be like babies. What is so significant of being a baby? 
You know what it is about being a baby? A baby never stops moving. A baby thinks that it can do anything. And a baby is willing to cry for what it wants. With this, let it be that this is the last Tisha B'Av. This is the last time we will mourn. We won't see the sorrows anymore. And we'll truly see the happiness and the redemption that is promised to us by our prophets. And may it happen speedily in our days. I would like to ask you today to join me in a very unorthodox crusade. I'm calling today for the abolishment of Tisha B'Av. Tisha B'Av is the day that for thousands of years the Jewish people have mourned the destruction of our temples, have sat on the floor, have cried, have read tearful lamentations, and I'm saying enough. And it's not because I don't like to fast, and it's not because it's uncomfortable to sit on the floor. I've got a much deeper reason, and I'm going to lay it out for you, and I'd like you to join me on my crusade by the time we're done this video. Let's understand first what Tisha B'Av is, and then we'll talk about how we can abolish it. For starters, Tisha B'Av is not simply the mourning of the destruction of temples that happened 2,000 years ago. If it was simply that, they should be the ones mourning, and we should be like, bummer for them. What we are now mourning is the fact that we live today in a society that doesn't have the temples, that doesn't have what the messianic era would bring. You see, at the end of this exile is going to be the Messiah. And the Messiah and the rebuilding of the temples is so much more than simply building some old buildings in Jerusalem. It's a fundamental seismic shift in the way the world operates. And by the way, that's what I'm calling to abolish. Let's understand what the Messianic era brings, and let's see whether we want that or not. So for starters, we're going to move to Isaiah. Isaiah is the prophet um, more so than every other prophet who prophesied about the end of days, about the Messianic era, the era that will directly come after this exile. And he writes the following. First, we'll look at Isaiah 2, 4. Isaiah 2, 4 says that when the Messiah comes, he will judge among the nations and will settle the arguments of many people. He will basically make world peace. He's going to settle all the differences, all the border differences, all the religious sectarian conflicts. Then, once all the conflicts are over, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift sword against nation, and they will no longer study war. Basically, when the Messiah comes, there will no longer be war in the world. Now, why would that be? That would be because they would have learned a much greater way. There would be so much light coming into the world. The Messiah would herald such an amazing wealth of light and wisdom into the world that people would drop all their unenlightened practices, such as war and conflict. Let's see another example of what the prophet Messiah says will happen at the end of days. This is a very famous prophecy, and you'll often hear of it being brought to you by missionaries, Christian missionaries. They love to quote Isaiah, and ironically, Isaiah actually is the biggest disproof of the idea of Jesus as a Messiah. They love to say to you, hey, your own Bible says that our Savior is the Messiah. And you say, really? Because in Isaiah, it said that when the Messiah comes, there'll be no more war. And last I checked, there's wars all over the world. Furthermore, what else does Isaiah say? So this is the famous, a staff will emerge from Jesse, right? A staff, a, a child will come from Jesse, from the house of Jesse. Jesse is King David's father. David is the root of all the messianic line. And it says the following, The spirit of Hashem will rest upon him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and fear of Hashem. He will be imbued with a spirit of fear for Hashem and will not need to judge by what his eyes see nor decide by what his ears hear. And it goes on to describe how he will start to give of his counsel and judge the nations. And then this amazing thing will happen. The wolf will lie with the sheep. The leopard will lie down with the kid and a calf, a lion, and a fatling. A young fatling is a young sheep. Will walk together and a young child will lead them. A cow and bear will graze, and their young will lie down together, and a lion, like cattle, will eat hay. So the predators are even going to give up 
their diet. They're going to start moving to veganism. The lion will become a vegan. And a lion, like cattle, will eat hay. A suckling will play by a viper's hole. And a newly weaned child will stretch his hand towards the lair of a snake. There will be no fear from animals, because even animals will stop any type of negative behavior. Now here comes the key. Lo yareu velo yashrisu. They will do no bad, and nor destroy in all of my sacred mountain, for the earth will be filled with knowledge of God, like the waters cover the sea. So not only will the Messianic era bring total peace, it will happen because absolute knowledge of God will happen. There will be so much godly light filling the world that no one will want to do anything negative to anyone else. So much so that the lion will not even want to eat his former prey, the water buffalo or the gazelle. So not only are we talking about the cessation of all war, we're talking about the cessation of all negative human behavior pretty much. People are not going to want to steal from one another. People are not going to want to lie to, cheat. There's going to be an absolute sense of not just world peace, but world goodness. This is the messianic era that we yearn for. This is the messianic era that people have been saying, Ani mamin be'amun shalema. I believe with a complete faith, Beviyas HaMashiach, in the coming of the Messiah, and even though he tarries, even though he delays every day I wait for him, which is one of the 13 principles of Jewish faith. So it sounds like a pretty good deal. Why do I want to abolish this? Why do I want to stop mourning on Tisha B'av when what we're doing is sitting on the floor and saying, woe is to us that we live in this God-anemic world when we could be living in a temple era with the knowledge of God everywhere, with world peace, with everything we want. So why in the world would I say, let's stop mourning? Let's stop calling for the Messianic era. So here we go. Let's understand, what is your role in this world? What is my role in the world? What are we here for? What we are here for in this world is to bring godly light into the world. So to speak, the cliche to make the world a better place, but for real. To bring more beauty, love, tolerance, sanctity, purity, serenity, peace, understanding. That's what we're here to do. As a matter of fact, there's a great sage whose name was Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato, who was both an Italian rabbi, Kabbalist, philosopher. He actually even wrote some operas. Brilliant, incredibly talented man, died at a very young age. But before passing away, he wrote a number of great, great works, chief amongst them the Mesilas Yesharim, the Path of the Just, but also the Derech Hashem, the Way of God. Another one of his works was Das Tavunos, the, the Understanding of, of Deep Wisdoms. And he writes there the following. Maha Voda Bechlal, what is the job of a person in this world? It's to remove any defects in his own character, which is, he explains, the evil that is found inside of every one of us. We all have negative traits. And then, he says, at first you're supposed to remove any wickedness from within. The Acharov, and afterwards, Our job is to try to remove negativity from anywhere in the world, anywhere that we touch. So here, Rav Moshe Chaim Lutzato is kind of lay, laying out what our role here in this world is. Remove negativity. Bring the light. Okay, that sounds like a good thing. But here's the problem, guys. As soon as the Messiah comes, guess what? We're out of a job. I recently watched a bunch of the uh, tellers at a Chase Bank near me studiously installing and setting up these new robo-tellers, right? They've got these new machines in the bank. And now they, you don't have to go to the teller and wait online for the teller. You can go walk up to one of these new machines and it's got far more capabilities than a regular ATM machine. And I'm watching, they're giving a training to the staff and I'm thinking, guys, you're cutting off your own legs. The more successful this machine is, the more you're out of a job. You're cutting off your own legs. So here's what I'm thinking. Our job in this world all that we're supposed to be doing is to bring down the light. But guess what? If Messiah comes, he is bringing the mega light. 
He is bringing the baseball stadium floodlights, lighting up the whole world. The world will be filled with knowledge of God like waters cover the sea. Where does that leave me? I'm like a little dude with a lighter sitting there trying to light up the room. And then suddenly Messiah comes, floods the world with light. And what are we supposed to do? What's our job? What's our role? I came here to be a warrior of light. I came here to be a fighter and a champion on behalf of goodness. I've got nothing to do once the Messiah comes. I'm pretty much out of a job. So why in the world do I want the Messiah? Why don't I just want, <laughs> let's not mourn this Tisha above. Because guess what? This exile, this diaspora, all this darkness the Jewish people have been steeped in for the last 2,000 years, that's all of our opportunity. That's where I can come in with my little flashlight and make big light because it's so dark all around us, because we're in exile, because we're in diaspora, because there's no Messiah, because there's no wisdom and knowledge of God in the world, because there's still warfare and struggle and toil and crime and thievery and betrayal. So therefore, I would like to call for the abolishment of Tisha B'Av. Please join me in this petition. No more Tisha B'Av. Stop mourning this exile. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to you or me because it gives us all the opportunity in the world. We can be warriors of the light. We can come into a dark, dark world with our flashlight and light up so much our own little corner of the world or even a little bigger portion of the world because of its darkness. So thanks for the darkness. I'm going to celebrate this Tisha B'Av. But actually, I'm not. It sounds good, right? It's a good argument. But it's so flawed. Because it is entirely, entirely selfish. It's all about me. I want to be a warrior of the light. I want to be a hero. I want to be a knight in shining armor, riding in on that white stallion with a banner. And because of that, I want the rest of the world to stay mired in suffering and pain and warfare. What am I, crazy? How selfish can I be? There are Jews all over the world living in fear because of anti-Semitism that is rising alarmingly all over the world. You go to synagogues almost anywhere in Europe, and in order to get in, you've got to go through intense security. There are Jews living in cities all over Israel as a matter of fact, every Jew living in Israel is within rocket range of some form or other of the thousands and thousands of stockpiled rockets in Syria and Lebanon. We have our family, our brothers and sisters living in Sderot who have rockets falling upon them all the time. A child's kindergarten was just blown up a few days ago. How many children are there suffering from cancer? How many families torn apart by dishonesty, betrayal? How many communities reeling from the behaviors of various members that betrayed the trust of everyone in the community, preying on children, stealing funds from local organizations, there's so much darkness out there, and I want all that darkness to stay so that I can be a warrior? Really? This is how we got into exile in the first place. The way we got into exile was when every man was just concerned for his own, not concerned for the good of everybody else. There's a famous story in the Talmud that describes the events precipitating the destruction of the temple, there was this man, Kamsa and Bar Kamsa. They hated each other. One invited the other one over for a, for a big meal. And he kicked him out because he invited the wrong person. You were supposed to invite my friend. You invited my enemy. And he kicked him out. It made a big mockery and embarrassment of him. And that one man who felt so mocked and scorned, and especially there were many rabbis at that meal, he said, I'm going to the Roman government and I'm going to get them to destroy this temple. Because he himself was slighted. He felt hurt. It was all about his feelings. It wasn't about what was best for the world. 
It was about, I've been hurt, I've been pained, I'm going to take action. As a matter of fact, our very first sin ever, the primordial sin of Adam, was because Adam wanted to be a hero. God told him, don't eat from the fruit. And Adam says, really? That's all i got to do is just not eat from the fruit? I'm going to go down in history as the guy who didn't eat the fruit? He says, no, no, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to eat the fruit. I'm going to plunge the world into darkness and moral chaos, and then I'm going to serve God properly, and then I'll be a hero. So I'll be the guy who brought all the light in the dark world. Now I'm living in the Garden of Eden. There's light everywhere. And all I've got to do is one little mitzvah, don't eat from the fruit. I want to be a much bigger hero. I want to be the knight in shining armor. So I'm going to plunge the whole world into darkness so that I can come through with my, flash, my flashlight lance. Tisha B'Av is not a day when we think about ourselves. I may be very comfortable. I may have just paid off my mortgage. I may have just gotten a promotion at work. I may have just graduated summa cum laude from a prestigious university, and I've got so many career opportunities open for me. And for me, I say, life's pretty good here. But it's not about me. The reason why we sit on the floor on Tisha B'Av and mourn is because we see the Jewish people, and indeed the world, in much more collective terms. If there's pain anywhere, that's pain that I share. It's a burden that I share. Selfish thinking is what got us into this exile, the fighting, the pettiness, only thinking of oneself, what's better for me, what's better for me. The way we get out of exile, the way we become really big people, is when we think in much bigger terms, when our sense of me envelops other people, when I see other people's pain, and I say, I don't care if I could be a hero in this pre-Messianic era, those people are suffering, and I'll do everything. I'll give up on all my rights to be a future hero just to see world peace, just to see the world filled with knowledge of God, where people are not urged to sin, people are not urged to commit acts of violence, pain, and suffering. So this Tisha B'Av, I actually ask you, my dear friends, please mourn with me. Mourn with me that we live in an era where people are still unfortunately so petty, so selfish, so self-centered that all we are is thinking about what's best for us, every warlord in the world, every person committing white-collar crime, blue-collar crime. It's all being driven by the same selfishness that got us into this exile. When we mourn Tisha B'Av, what we're saying is we yearn for a time when we can all stop being selfish and our concerns for ourselves can become enveloped by our concerns for the greater good. And when we do that, when we truly see everyone else's pain as our own, then we will have started the ball rolling on the world being filled with knowledge of God, because that is the light of God. And when we start the process, God will surely see that we've started the process of bringing the Messiah, and he will complete the process, and the Messiah will come, the temple will be, will be rebuilt, and the world will truly see the infinite light an incredible peace. And that, my friends, is something worth mourning for, but more importantly, praying for and taking action for. Thank you. Kol shenivakesh lu yehi.